Good evening. I'm Harold Pacius. We're on the air again with another edition of Pacius on the News. Uh, tonight we have a, uh, a very interesting guest, Frederick B. Hill, a former reporter uh, with the Baltimore Sun, a former State Department uh, official who's written a book called Dereliction of Duty. Dereliction of Duty. And it's a series of columns that Mr. Hill has written uh, for the Baltimore Sun, for the Dallas Morning News, for the Bangor Daily News. And he lives in Maine. Uh, he's a graduate of Bowdoin College. And he moved back to Maine uh, after he uh, left Washington. But he continues to uh, do these columns. And Dereliction of Duty, as you might have guessed, uh, is a reference to the current president of the United States. Well, Fred, welcome to the show. We're looking forward to chatting with you. Thank you very much. I enjoy Glad to be here. You undertook to assemble these columns that you've written over several years uh, about Trump. What motivated you to do that? Well, I had been, I wrote columns for the Bangor Daily News for four years after I retired. I had worked for 21 years in the State Department where I really couldn't write very much publicly. And I did write a column for the Daily News in Bangor for four years during the end of the Bush uh, 43 administration and then the Obama administration. And then I kind of stopped doing it. And it was, I really didn't pay much attention to the 2016 campaign until Trump emerged as the leading candidate. And I was just astonished that the Republican Party was going to nominate somebody with out any experience, proven uh, bad judgment in different casino businesses, close ties to the Russians. But I think the catalyst for my deciding to write columns uh, was mainly generated when 50 leading Republican national security experts, including Mike Hayden, two chiefs of the Homeland Security, Tom Ridge and Chirkoff, Michael Chirkoff, uh, Elliot Cohen, a leading Republican strategist for both Bush administrations, and a whole number of other people, 50 people said Donald Trump could be the most, would be if elected, the most reckless and most dangerous president in American history. And that really startled me as somebody who'd worked in the State Department for 21 years doing war games on different national security issues. I might point out for three Republican administrations, I went there after working for a Republican senator, Senator Mathias, a respected Republican in days when Republican senators were truly bipartisan. The uh, Reagan administration, I then uh, the Bush 41 administration, and then the Clinton administration, and then the first six years of Bush 43, and doing war games and discussions on leading national security issues. And that's when I became to be startled and I began writing columns and two of the first three columns I wrote, I think, have stood up under time. One was on Trump's lies and his accusation that Obama and Hillary Clinton created ISIS. ISIS grew out of the Bush-Cheney invasion of Iraq, which created Al-Qaeda and then led eventually to ISIS. And there were other lies. And he also made a claim at some point, I know more than the generals. <laughs> they came, we came to see what that meant. Most of the generals that came to work for him have left and called him an idiot, a moron, and other <laughs> epithets. T timing of his, another article was based on climate change, and his, I felt that his calling climate change a hoax was just disgraceful when 90, more than 90% of scientists around the world believe that global warming is a key aspect of climate change. And for him to call it a, a hoax, I think, frankly, Donald Trump is the hoax. He claims everything is a hoax. The Russian interference, climate change, almost everything that he doesn't like is a hoax. Well, I frankly think Donald Trump is the hoax that's been perpetrated on the American public. And I think it's been proven over four years of very little accomplishment at home and abroad. Well, he must be a, an, a, an effective... Uh a hoax perpetrator because uh, he's uh, always had around 40 percent 
never a majority, obviously, but always had about 40% of the people uh, with him in the, in the polls. He won. He didn't get, he didn't win the popular vote, but he did get elected uh, president uh, through the electoral college. So, uh, my view, though, is that from day one, when he became president, even before that, going on the national security uh, angle, he was asked at an interview with either the Washington Post or the New York Times who his five top national security experts were. He reeled off five people who were almost completely unknown. One of them, Carter Page, was spending a good deal of his time in Moscow. He's the one that's the focus of the FBI investigation. They had good reason to look into why uh, he had so many Russian ties at the time. And I would just say on the 40%, if a lot of those people would look at his record and not his rhetoric and fear-mongering, they might see that he's accomplished very little. You know, a friend of mine talked about Trump and says, well, he's a Republican. I don't like his character. I don't like a lot of things he says. I don't like his judgment. But I like the results. Well, look at the results that we've got after four years of Donald Trump. About the worst crisis in American history since the Depression, if not the Civil War. Almost 200,000 Americans dead because of his denial, delay, calling it a Democratic hoax. He did on February 28th, almost six weeks after intelligence agencies had warned him of the gravity of this crisis. Yeah, he's done all those things, but, and I run into them too, uh, people that just love him, and they, uh, some friends of mine uh, said, uh, well, look what he's done, and of course, uh, what he's done is not substantive. Uh, it's, uh, they, they point to tax policy. Well, he kind of let Congress do that. He didn't, he, but, you know, I, I, I worked for a president who had these task forces in the White House developing legislation and ideas all the time. No ideas other than social attacks come out of this White House. And so uh, he just delegated it to Congress, and Congress came up with uh, a tax bill, and people can argue about whether the tax bill uh, is a good tax bill, certainly uh, D didn't favor uh, a lot of people. But in, in, in any event, um, that's what they say. Uh, he, the, tax he bill, the tax bill also uh, generated a huge uh, sense of deficit through the roof. And that's one of the things I find most uh, surprising and disappointing about the Republican Party uh, is that uh, some of the key factors in Republican uh, liturgy have been completely violated. One was fiscal restraint. That was in the 2016 platform of the Republican Party, which uh, in which they uh, said that the Obama administration had ballooned the national debt. Well, look where it is today, even before the uh, COVID-19 crisis. The Republican Party has just failed to recognize that they also no longer can be considered the party of national security. Now, that's partly the fault of Bush and Cheney for their reckless invasion of Iraq, which was probably the most strategic era in American history, almost uh, worse in some ways than Vietnam because of the consequences, not because of the number of deaths. And also on civil rights. The Republican Party today is no longer the party of Lincoln. It is the party of Trump, I agree. But they suppress voting. You have a president that says he won't, maybe won't leave office if he's defeated in November, who says that the election is, could be rigged and uses the post office, uh, one of the most venerated aspects of the American government, and tries to trash that as he's trashed the White House. Uh, vote, suppress voting. Uh, what more does the Republican followers of Trump need uh, in terms of accomplishments. Look at that 2016 platform, for example. Not only does it say that Obama ballooned the national debt, but it said that Obama divided and turned citizens against one another. <laughs> if anybody's turned citizens against one another, it's Donald Trump sending stormtroopers into different cities when they weren't even invited and cross the streets in Washington having his own military uh, knock over protesters, largely peaceful protesters, just so he could hold the Bible upside down for a photo op and across the street. 
even uh, General Milley turned around after that and said he didn't agree with it and wished he hadn't allowed that to happen. Uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, Esper, did the same. I would point out that Esper is the third or fourth Secretary of Defense. Trump is on his fourth or fifth round of a revolving door of increasingly inadequate, incompetent officials. And no more better example than this is this John Ratcliffe. Trump has gone from having, and I gave him the benefit of the doubt when I first wrote, James, 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 Let me interrupt you a second. When do you sure. explain to the audience who John Ratcliffe is? John Ratcliffe was a, is a congressman from Texas. He was one of the most vociferous uh, people in Trump's impeachment trial. Uh, Trump nominated him to be uh, director of national intelligence after Dan Coats, who was a very... Uh, sensible and courageous member headed the intelligence. And, and, Co and Coach was a Republican, right? And Coates was a Republican, and Coates had the courage to say, to disagree with Trump on uh, the problems in Syria, the threat from North Korea, the realistic view of Iran's nuclear program. And Trump uh, got rid of him quickly because he disagreed with him. So he nominated Ratcliffe uh, it took a small bit of uh, satisfaction in the fact that I wrote a column with my uh, friend, Ambassador Jim Goodby, in the Dallas Morning News, and the next day, Trump withdrew the nomination. Now, I don't claim that it was because of our column, because a lot of Republicans at that time also found Ratcliffe to be, to have inflated his resume, he claimed that he had some role in the arrest of uh, 300 illegal immigrants. Well, it turned out he had no role whatsoever. He didn't have any experience in intelligence. And yet Trump, after he got free of the uh, impeachment trial, nominated uh, uh, Ratcliffe again. Our friend Susan Collins uh, withdrew from him a promise not to uh, politicize the intelligence uh, world if he was going to uh, be the director of national intelligence. And what's happened? Last week, uh, and Ratcliffe said he would not politicize it. Last week, Ratcliffe said he would no longer offer uh, verbal presentations or summaries of the latest intelligence about election interference, largely from Russia. He'll only provide written ones. And what is that but a psychophant's reaction to Trump's pressure? So, Look, so they say that um, people that you talk to say, well, I don't like him. I don't like his personality. I don't like the way he does things, but uh, I, like, I, I like he's delivered. They say he's delivered. Now, uh, of course, people have said that uh, about other authoritarian leaders uh, in world history. Uh, you know, and I'm sure you know this, that when Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933 in, in Germany, the Nazi party was a de definitely a minority party. And uh, a lot of people made fun of, a lot of Germans made fun of Hitler. We have to remember that Germans are no different than us. Pe people all over the world are no different than us. We're all human beings. We all are afflicted with human nature. We have the same types of reactions. We're all the same. And so the Germans kind of mocked him, but he came to power and then he did certain things and he uh, took back the Sudetenland and he invaded uh, Czechoslovakia and he invaded Poland and he put people back to work, enormous defense spending. So uh, there was no more unemployment in Germany. So they would say, well, we don't like him. We think he's a bit of a fool. He's this, he's that. But he delivered. And he became very popular because he delivered. So there are a lot of Americans who think what your friends think, that he's delivered. Now, what is it? You've just commented. You don't know what it is that he's delivered. Uh, I don't think he has delivered, uh, Hal. And I think uh, I'd be the first to admit, I mean, he did, the stock market stayed high. But the economy, and he lied about this as well, was doing pretty well after Obama left office. Uh, there was a terrible financial meltdown in 2007, 2008. Obama inherited that. I think George Bush, 43, finally 
came around and helped uh, stabilize it, but it was pretty solid growth under Obama. It was 2% or more. And the fact that uh, Trump could claim the greatest economy in the world and stock market is uh, more important to him than the life and death of most Americans, frankly. That's about the only result he was able to accomplish was to keep uh, the economy humming to some extent. But as Warren Buffett's always said, and so many others, they've always had great faith in the uh, underlying strength of the American economy and its innovative ability, et cetera, et cetera. And why shouldn't it? So uh, he, he can claim that. But And I'd be the first to admit that if Donald Trump had shown leadership after the outbreak of COVID-19, if he had stepped up to the plate the way FDR did when Japan invaded uh, Pearl Harbor, or attacked Pearl Harbor, if he had shown leadership and ability, not undercut science and health and not come up with quack theories and denied it for two months. I mean, he, February 28th, he went to a rally in South Carolina and called COVID-19 a democratic hoax. He then re continued to deny it, delay it, make bad decisions. And then, you know, one of the things that uh, I think most revealing to Maine people, and I can't believe anybody in the second district can support Trump, he went to Guilford or that uh, plant up there. And during a meeting with Paul LePage, he called Janet Mills a dictator. Why doesn't she reopen? He said it several times. You can look at the video, just look it up. Uh, potential independents and Trump supporters. He sits there and with LePage, thank goodness he's gone as governor, and we have Janet Mills. He kept saying, she's a dictator. Why wouldn't she reopen? Well, governors in Florida, governors in Texas, governors in Nebraska, all reopened about that time following Donald Trump's advice. And look what happened. They're, the COVID-19 surged in all that states. Hal, today, Florida has more deaths than Japan and South Korea put together. All these other countries around the world have tackled this crisis because they had leaders who had guts, courage, vision, and smarts, and experience, I might add. Donald Trump's nothing but a flim-flam artist who had a bunch of casinos, got into the real estate business with his father's millions, and then depended on Russian investments to keep it going. He was in real trouble in 2007, 2008, and guess what? Even Eric Trump admitted that we don't need American money. We got plenty of money from Russia. I think one of the most abominable things about Trump to me is that Republicans always were the sternest, strictest, toughest opponents of communists. Well, Vladimir Putin is still a communist, and we've got an American president who has embraced an authoritarian virtual dictator who is a ruler for life. He's just got another uh, eight or 10 years. And this is a man that Trump admires. This is a man that Trump in Helsinki said, oh, I trust Don, uh, Vladimir Putin more than I trust my own intelligence agencies. John McCain, a true American hero who Donald Trump maligned. Another one of his great tendencies is to malign people who do good work, but he criticized him. Uh, John McCain said he had never seen somebody abase himself before a foreign tyrant the way that Trump did at Helsinki. And the most recent evidence of Trump's uh, glaring and un-American embrace of Russia is that he has done nothing but these proven allegations that Vladimir Putin and the Russians uh, paid bounties to the Taliban to kill American soldiers. And that on top of his calling the Russian interference in the 2000 election and continued support for their doing it now, to me, is just proof that he's almost not even an American. But to get back to Janet Mills, just for a second, he called her a dictator. But Janet Mills has done a good job making tough decisions. And guess where Maine is? Maine has, as you, we all know, the oldest population in the country, so very vulnerable yet it has one of the lowest per capita number of cases and deaths in the United States. She didn't reopen like Trump or tried to order her to. So, okay, that's, you know, I happen to agree. I mean, I, he's a con man. And, uh, but 
it works in America. You know, I get, uh, as you do, and everybody else watching this program does, uh, calls on the phone all the time from people with various scams. And how about this? And how about this? And send me money and so forth. And I ask myself, why do they do this? Well, they do it because it works. They wouldn't be calling on the phone if calling people on the phone and scamming them didn't work. Of course it works. And so people get fooled. And, and so there is that tendency in human beings to you know, listen to some scam artist and react positively to it. So now, if he hasn't done anything, why, why you know, he could win, he could win again. Um, so why, why is that? It seems to me that it's cultural, that there are so many people, you know, I, I, uh, I don't like, I think political correctness has gone too far in, in some respects. And all of these microaggression discussions by college students drives me nuts. But uh, his supporters are against what they call PC, political correctness. They always use, you know, why do you say happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas? You know, I'm a Christian, tell me M Merry Christmas. Well, that's fine. I have no problem saying Merry Christmas to people, but they use this as an example. So uh, what they, his rudeness, he's a very rude guy. They say is telling it like it is. You know, he's just being candid, telling it like it, it, it is. And um, his, vulgar, his vulgarness, they say, he has the courage to act, to be himself, to act like himself. And so they admire this. This is all, all non-substantive stuff. But they like it. And they, and they like it because also a lot of people are, are racist. Not everybody. But they will... His supporters will say there is no racism in America. They'll say, I, you know, no, yeah, no white supremacy. No, I agree, Hal. I think that culture has a lot to do with it. Um, this is a very diverse country, and uh, Obama held it together pretty well. Uh, uh, Trump, to me, has divided uh, people against you know, one another using very racist and ethnically uh, sour language, calling Mexicans rapists, uh, Muslims, barring them from all, all countries, not just uh, Iran or other places. Uh, and on the free speech issue, <laughs> I think, I think the, the, the overwhelming evidence is that he, uh, another way he violates his uh, responsibility to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States is the fact that he calls so much fake news. I mean, he is somebody who listened to Alex Jones, the person that said that the uh, awful massacre in Connecticut was a hoax. The, new, and, the Newtown shooting? Of Newtown of shooting, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Alex Jones argued that's a hoax. And Donald Trump respected this person. Donald Trump listens to these QAnon conspiracy. He encourages white supremacists. I, th I think it's a sad commentary that we have a president who desecrates the Oval Office the way he does, using the language he does, calling people human scum and snakes and sleazebags. I mean, presidents throughout history have used strong language, and I'm a great fan of H.L. Mencken, as my friend Alan Simpson was, who was in the Senate uh, when Chuck Mac Mathias and Bill Cohen were there, but uh, I don't think any president has stooped to the level of uh, nasty rhetoric. And sure, they can say it's locker room talk, but since what woman in this country can have much respect for a man who brags about grabbing women by the genitals, who has had so many cases of sexual abuse leveled against him. And I think it's one of the ironies of this day that the only news channel, and it's a big one, Fox News, has had so many of its executives accused of the same, very same behavior as Donald Trump's been accused of. Um, but to call, to me, as a former journalist, there are th several things. Uh, his lack of accomplishments in foreign policy, we can get to that in a minute, or one of my main problems with him, but the fact that he can 
repeatedly call the best newspapers in this country and CNN and other networks all fake news and the enemy of the people. The enemy of the people is an expression that goes way back in history, but it's been made most famous by Joseph Stalin, Putin's hero. And Donald Trump repeatedly has used the words enemy of the people to describe the very best papers in this country. So as far as I'm concerned, he's against free speech. If he is elected to another term in office, not only will he trample on the rule of law more than he has, and we can talk about that, but he will try to uh, limit the free speech of the American people. It's not, it, that's more critical than a culture war. Uh, as, and I agree with you about the political correctness, but I think that political correctness divide is partly due to the diversity of this country. And it is, that's one of the things that we should be proud of. Instead, he's abused the issue of immigration. We had a serious problem with immigration. George Bush, 43, tried to do something about it. I think that was one of his best steps. And Obama did as well. And they had some agreements at one point, but Marco Rubio and a couple of other Republicans chickened out at the last minute when that deal between the group of eight was about to be made and it fell through the cracks. And that's uh, an issue that Donald Trump has exploited. You don't need a border wall. Most of the experts say you just need some good uh, reform of uh, immigration laws. And frankly, I've read several articles by people in towns in the Midwest, Trump territory, who have lots of immigrant workers in their neighborhood, and they get along with them very well, but they still swallow some of Trump's ridiculous rhetoric about immigration. M M13, I have people say they're afraid of they're coming in their window, practically. And he exaggerates these uh, well, fears. <laughs> The, the, uh, the, the, this business about the press is a hoax and the enemy of the people, actually, I, I find that kind of interesting because everybody watching this program knows that everything the president says is recorded. It's on video or it's on a, a voice recording. So what they do is just report what he says and does. He has these... these uh, you know, every day, what do you, the, the, uh, the thing that he texts out every day uh, uh, on social media. And uh, so it's all there. I mean, all they're doing is reporting what he says. He says it and they report it. And then he says, it's a hoax. It's like when he was in England, he said something about the prime minister on television. It was re recorded. Everybody saw it. It was a video. And then he said later, I didn't say it. He gets away with it. So why does he get away with it? Is it because people, 90% of the Republicans, according to the polls, strongly support, I don't strongly support Donald Trump, 90% of them. So he can get away with it. He knows. He said, I could go out on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody dead and my supporters would never leave me. He's right. He's right about that, and he knows he's he knows that's true. So what do you do about that? It's the voters that put him there. It's the public who wants him to continue. Some in the public. What can you do about that? Nothing. Well, I think Biden and Kamala Harris will make a, a very strong campaign on the fact that he's accomplished very little, and uh, he's got more pretty much more than a 10 ring circus between what uh, the people going in and out of the white house, people like general Madison, and Rick Tillerson and John Kelly all leaving. As I said, he's on the fourth or fifth level of, of people that uh, are his key advisors. The, uh, I think the, the record has got to be paid more attention to than the rhetoric, frankly. And the people I think dislike the TV reality show, I remember working for, I uh, did, did some campaigning for Jared Golden uh, two years ago, and I met a woman in Lewiston or Gardner, and uh, I asked her, talked about Golden's record, and Golden had actually worked for Susan Collins at one point. He's a young Marine who volunteered and went to 
Afghanistan or Iraq uh, after he'd barely out of high school. He served this country. He's a very uh, brave and uh, I think energetic young man. But I asked this woman, what did she think of Trump? And after we had a conversation, she said, well, I don't like him. I think he's foul. I don't know he's a good leader, but boy, does he put on a good show. And I think that's part of the reason that I don't think the level is 90%. I think it's a lot lower than that. And I think, to me, one of the biggest problems is the lack of courage on the part of the Republican Party. And that started to fall apart in the, and I, the last section of my book is on the collapse of the Republican Party. And it goes, it's not due, due to Trump. It was falling apart in uh, terms of its ethical and uh, political vision long before Trump. And that's probably why he got elected, because they had 16 or 17 other candidates, and none of them, including some good people like Jeb Bush, uh, were there, but uh, overrun by his foul language and humiliation and braggadocio. But Norman Ornstein of the American Enterprise Institute, which is a conservative think tank in Washington, and Tom Mann wrote articles about the Republican Party back to 2008 and 2010 about how they were losing their respect for American values. And they predicted Trump's rise even before he began to take off in the 2016 campaign. They uh, wrote that, and I can't remember, it's in one of my columns, but uh, that the Republican Party was losing its bearings and losing its uh, respect for uh, principled uh, action, compromise. I mean, look at Mitch McConnell. He held up uh, or held open a seat on the Supreme Court for almost a year just to uh, and, and basically. Yeah, that's true. Let, let me interrupt you. Yeah, it's true. But the, 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 the 90% of the Republicans don't care. They're, they're happy he did. Well, that's true. No, that's true. And they want conservative judges. And in fact, that's one of the only things that he accomplished was to uh, to get two Supreme Court justices appointed or nominated. And and what's hard about that when you have a Senate majority? That and the tax cut, which uh, basically enriched the 1%. It didn't do much for his own supporters. And a criminal justice bill were the only accomplishments he was able to achieve. There was infrastructure health care he tried to oh, he's over he's now suing to overturn obama's health care right. because he Tell didn't me. like obama he's, yeah. he there's so many things he could have done in his first term what, what, he didn't but on well, foreign po- al on foreign policy this is a man who's supposed to be the uh, maker of the art of the deal he's transactional guess what he embraced the worst dictator in the world kim jong un nothing's happened Kim is no. still firing he, off missiles. No, he he, he got played. He got played because everybody knows. Look, people who support Trump who are watching this program know how easy it is to play Trump because of his massive, uncontrolled ego. Kim Il, uh, Kim Il, uh, John, he knew all you do is play to his ego, tell him what a great man he is, and so he played him. They had these meetings. He just played him. And, and they all do that. So uh, let me ask you this. What, what's going to happen in the future? Uh, you, you, I think, interested in history. I'm certainly interested in history. I, I love history and read it. We've had, we've had crises, this type of crisis, this type of uh, uh, social fire in our country before, and it was in the 1850s, angry passions and divisions. And ultimately, people took up guns. Now, we have a president now who's stoking the fire, pouring gasoline on the fire. Are we in danger? He gets reelected. Now we're going to have four more years, unrestrained, really unrestrained uh, of this. What happens to our country? Where are we going? Is it, are, is, are they going to, people going to be in the streets? 
already, you know, we see a guy out in Milwaukee the other day with his AK-47, 18, 17 years old. I'm going to bring order. I'm going to put down these insurgents and kills a couple people. Is that where we're heading? Total chaos and guns? Well, I think, that's, war. I think that's one of the worrisome scenarios if Trump were to be elected because he's shown himself to not care about, uh, he claims himself to be the law and order president. Well, the chaos, as far as I'm concerned, is not the chaos he claims that Biden would bring. It's the chaos that's occurring in his administration, partly generated by uh, some of the uh, poor government uh, actions that have been taken, his rhetoric, uh, his encouragement of extremist groups. I mean, the Charlottesville incident is probably the most uh, reflective of, uh, of his attitude, where he said there are good people on both sides. Well, one side was mostly white supremacists and neo-Nazis. And uh, it's a very sad commentary that he encourages uh, groups like QAnon, which he's retweeted, uh, talking about tweets. I mean, can you imagine a president in the Oval Office who spends 60% of his time watching television and tweeting? But I think the danger, there's been several mass shootings. They repeatedly happen. He suddenly says he feels sorry for people and he goes to visit them, says he's going to do something, but then does nothing about it. And the fact is that uh, there's so many guns in this country, it's, it, it's, it's quite frightening. And we need a, a president that has the courage to show leadership to show some vision, to bring people together and not divide them as he's divided them. Well, again, true, and I just return to my prior question, which is, uh, yeah, you know, all these things are true, uh, and he is a, a, a con man, and he doesn't tell the truth. Uh, those are facts, but we're politicized. Everything's politicized now, so... Many Republicans like him for one reason only. They can only find one reason to like him, and it's enough. And that reason is he's not a Democrat. That's true. That's, I, and and that's, the fact that he can only accuse Democrats of uh, being socialists, I don't think Joe Biden is a socialist or going to bring socialism to this country. I, I just would like to ask a lot of Republicans, I mean, a lot of the banks in this country get huge billions, trillion dollars of support from the government of the United States. That's a form of socialism. Donald Trump gave $15 billion to farmers in the Midwest after his uh, tariffs against China went afoul. That's socialism. Is there any of these Republicans? And I've been a Republican three times in my life, frankly, once when I was a young man. And, uh, I even voted for Nixon once. I think that was a big mistake. I ended up covering Watergate. But uh, later on, I worked for Senator Mathias. But uh, the... Uh, but, but let me ask you this. Uh, they, so he's, you know, uh, Biden is the dreaded Democrat, the dreaded Democrat. So they feel that but it goes back, I think, to the social issue. Uh, the country's changing. Obama, a lot of people hated Obama. And nothing really to really hate Obama as a human being. He's nice to his wife, loyal to his wife, lovely to his children, nice family life, looked after his mother-in-law, nice guy, sense of humor, good educational background, smart guy. But... He's a Democrat. So, well, a Democrat, and he had one other added burden, was his color. Right. Now, people are looking at the, world, the country changing. This has been, whether, had, this has nothing to do with the civil rights battle. America, the history of America, is as a white Christian country. That's it. That's our history, despite all of the diversity, despite all of the immigration. Some people embrace the diversity and the immigration, and they say that strengthened us. But others worry that 
because they're white. They worry, I'm going into second place. I'm not going to be the big shot anymore. So I think that's part of it. They, and they see Trump with his finger in the dike, holding back the hordes. After Trump, the deluge. What do you think of that? There is a strong underlying element that is so worried about losing that white Christian uh, majority or control. But I think it goes more deeply to the lack of education in this country. And it's kind of disappointing uh, given the amount of great educational institutions we have, but maybe it's at the high school and secondary school level that the decline in the use of uh, teaching of civics has been so degraded and you know, just not emphasized that very few people seem to understand uh, the strengths of the diversity that we have and draw on that strength rather than fearing it and being afraid of it. Uh, so many people have come around to accepting uh, black and Hispanic people in their neighborhoods and living with them. Yet we have now uh, certainly plenty of underlying tensions that uh, persist because despite the uh, emancipation bill, all the different laws that were passed, civil rights bills, you still have a, a deep fear and a willingness to trade on racist slurs. Uh, to me, the, one of the underlying problems, as well as civics and education, is the amount, despite uh, this country's great history, is the amount of apathy. Only one in three people, uh, there are, every presidential election for a long time now, only uh, there have been one in three people who have not voted. And that is terrible. And this goes across all segments of society, not white, not black, not Hispanic. It's, uh, to me, the three underlying, there were four reasons for Trump's getting elected in 2016. One was the bankruptcy of the Republican Party. The second was the Democrats put up a candidate who wasn't uh, very uh, popular. Uh, she was popular among Democrats, but not broadly popular. And that was a, probably a legacy of Bill Clinton's administration, although he was a reasonably effective president, despite some of the sexual misdemeanors and uh, felonies. But um, to me, that was one factor. A third was uh, Russian interference, massive Russian interference. And just as a sidelight, Trump calls it a hoax. But the Senate, not only Mueller called it massive Russian interference, but the Senate Intelligence Committee, 11 Republicans and 10 Democrats, have unanimously endorsed the fact there was massive Russian interference, and it continues this day. And the fourth reason was the Electoral College, which I think should be changed at one point. But there are three underlying reasons, I think, and one is apathy, the fact that voter turnout is so low. The second one is the, what we've touched on already, prejudice. And there was prejudice in 2016 against Obama and against Hillary Clinton as a woman. And the third reason, frankly, is we have with social media these days and the ability to abuse uh, the availability of it, there is so many people who just don't keep themselves informed. I don't expect people to read a lot of newspapers or just listen to NPR, but they should do something more than watch just MSNBC or Fox News. So um, we've covered a lot of we've covered a lot of ground. We we're now heading toward an election. What do you think? If do you think there's any doubt that if Donald Trump is behind in um, October, that he will talk a lot about the election being stolen from him? Yes. Well, he tried that in 2016. He, he, didn't, he didn't expect to win in 2016. Uh, he, and that's clearly why he got off to such a rocky start. And they had those meetings in Trump Tower. They had Michael Flynn, the future first national security advisor, talking to the Russians. And uh, they had s s so many contacts with the Russians because through Roger Stone 
and WikiLeaks, they were able to continue to push the Hillary Clinton uh, email abuse. And I agree that was abusive. I would also point out that Colin Powell also used uh, emails, a private email service, so it wasn't just Hillary Clinton. But I do think uh, that he said then the election would be rigged if uh, Hillary Clinton won. And then after the election from day one, he continued to try to say it was uh, rigged and what he didn't lose by 3 million votes in the popular vote, that he had actually won the vote. And he actually tried to get different people in different states like Maine and headed by that guy in Kansas, Kovach, to show that there were lots of, uh, there were 3 million illegal <laughs> voters. So I, I think he will. I think he'll try to continue to uh, uh, threaten not to leave office if he were to lose. I, and so what will happen? He won't, let's say, and this is not uh, inconceivable, let's say he leave, he loses. Uh, don't you think it's almost certain that uh, there will be, uh, you know, he'll say, I'm not leaving, I'm not conceding, and we're going to have investigations and uh, court cases. Don't and that, will be the, that, that will be the test of the Republican Party, whether people like Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, who once called <laughs> Trump every name in the book from jerk to idiot, um, now embraces him. But I think that's when we'll see what, whether the Republican Party has any spine. In 1974, and I covered Watergate before I went to London for the Baltimore Sun, uh, Early in 1974, and I did this in my last column in Maine newspapers, uh, Republicans early in 1974 recognized that Nixon was on very fragile, uh, thin ice, and it was uh, Barbara Conable, a New York congressman who you probably knew, uh, even wrote in his diary that he thought uh, he, his, his actual quote uh, he said in his diary, it's hard to think of Nixon without revulsion, not because I consider him loathsome, but, but because I consider him incredibly stupid as a leader. That was January of 1974. It wasn't until the Supreme Court freed up the tapes of Nixon's White House meetings with Haldeman and Ehrlichman and other people like uh, Liddy that Republicans, including Bill Cohen, my classmate from Bowdoin, had the courage to say that he probably will be impeached. And even then, it wasn't sure that it would happen. But in June 23, uh, there were further tapes released. And one of them was of a meeting between Nixon and Haldeman in which Nixon told Haldeman to tell the FBI to stop the investigation. Stop the investigation. It's the same thing Trump has done. And it was then that Barry Goldwater, an icon of the Republican Party from Arizona, John Hughes, the House Minority Leader from Arizona, and Senator Hugh Scott, a moderate Republican senator from Pennsylvania, they went to the White House and they told Richard Nixon on August 7th, just 46 years ago, you need to leave. And Nixon resigned two days later. If this scenario plays out where Trump does clearly lose and has no basis for staying and tries to claim that uh, it's been rigged, I think we'll see the test then of whether we have Republican leaders in the Senate with courage or just or become Trumpite uh, psychophants. Yeah. In my days, the question would have been back in the 60s, whether we have leaders who are patriots first. And basically we did. Most of the members of Congress, the Senate and the House, ultimately were patriots. That came first. Uh, there's some question now, and we'll see the answer. Look, you, you were an investigative reporter, right? Yes. So, uh, you know, I helped put, uh, get Spiro Agnew out of office. All right. So ba based on your experience, uh, you believe ultimately with respect to any president, anybody in such a public position, that everything will come out over time, that books will be written, people will talk, every, you know, people that are working in the White House and who are privy firsthand 
to what's going on, what's being said, it'll all come out ultimately. I, I do. I mean, the question is, why hasn't he released his taxes? I think there are three reasons for that. Yeah. One is that if one, one, they'll show that he's not as rich as he claims to be. The second one is will show that he's a skinflint, that he basically, um, and that's been proven, he admitted a couple of years ago in a lawsuit and paid $2 million that he had used money they had raised from veterans, uh, supposedly to help veterans issues. He had used it for his campaign, and he'd also used it to pay Donald Trump's Boy Scout dues, things like that, and have paintings done of himself. That's how narcissistic he is. And I also think it'll show maybe the Russian, uh, it, the extent of Russian investment in his Trump Towers. In the 1980s, a lot of Russian oligarchs saw the collapse of the Soviet Union coming, and they started to take money out of the Soviet Union. And I traveled to the Soviet Union as a reporter then. Uh, you could see there, people were selling things, selling art and selling, I was offered a nice painting by some, I think, KGB agent, and maybe it was a trap, I did, declined it, but he was trying to make money, and this was uh, in the mid 80s. Uh, they could they could see it coming. Guess where they bought properties? They bought apartments in Trump Tower. If anybody wants to doubt that, look at uh, Craig Unger in the New Republic's articles, Russian laundromat. They, they define how much the Russian mafia have uh, supported Trump early on, not just recently. But I think that'll come out. Why hasn't he released his taxes? Why hasn't he released his grades? Why is he so defensive about everything and try to keep it hush-hush? I mean, there are a lot of lawsuits uh, against Deutsche Bank and other people that supported him, even when they def he def uh, defrauded them. But I do think uh, things will come out, and it's too bad they don't come out before then. But ultimately, so if I'm a supporter of Trump, uh, Ultimately, things will come out. You know, I was a supporter of Clinton, and things came out about Clinton uh, that disturbed me. Uh, things that, while he was president, you know, his behavior obviously was uh, uh, reprehensible. And so, uh, and then when, uh, after Clinton was president, I came to the conclusion that uh, the, the, the Clintons really tried to take such advantage of what of, of their power and connections and like to hang around with rich people even like to hang around with donald trump went went to trump's wedding yeah. so that stuff i don't like it's going to come out everything is going to come out so if i'm a trump supporter or i should say to trump supporters stand by because you're standing with this guy and there will be no secrets ultimately and everybody will be judged based on history, not on their political instincts. They will be judged in the context of history. I'm judged in the context of history. I worked for Lyndon Johnson in the White House during the Vietnam War. I was a strong supporter of Johnson's policies at that time. I was dead wrong. I was wrong. And I was wrong about the positions I took. And uh, 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 and I admit it, and it's uncomfortable. And so it's the same with the Trump supporters. Remember, everything will come out. Tax returns, Russia, Putin. Remember, Putin is the only person he's never insulted. Never. He's insulted almost every Republican. <laughs> he's insulted almost every leader in the world, but never not once has it been, it been even a suggestion of an insult about Vladimir Putin. And the reason will come out one day. I don't know what it is, but we'll know ultimately if we live long enough. Proof of the pudding is, take a look at the people at that convention who spoke in favor of Donald Trump. It was like a family gathering. I mean, talk about corruption and nepotism. Jared Kushner is the last person who's qualified to be head of a Middle East peace initiative. But look at the people that spoke in favor of Biden, Colin Powell, John Kasich, and just a number of others. And look at the number of respected Americans 
who now see Trump for what he is. General Mattis, Rex Tillerson, called him a effing moron. After a meeting at the Pentagon, which to me was one of the most frightening experiences I learned about, it's uh, documented in the book by uh, the Washington Post reporters, Philip Rucker and Carol Leonig, there was a briefing in the Pentagon in 2017. It was the first briefing for Donald Trump, new president, on the extent of U.S. influence around the world, the different threats we have. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, the generals and admirals, our top military people, briefed them on these issues. And Trump had a tantrum, like a child, and I maintain he is an insecure child. But Trump went off on a tantrum and called our leading generals, dopes and babies, and people I won't go to war with. This is not long after he'd said, I know more than the generals, of course. And that's the meeting after which Rex Tillerson, whose father was a combat veteran, Rex Tillerson, his secretary of state, said he is a effing moron. John Kelly has called him an idiot. H.R. McMaster has agreed. General Mattis said he has the brains of a fifth grader. But I just want to go back to the people that have now looked at Trump with clear eyes who are Republicans, not just the 50 Republicans, national security experts, which are now 70. Now 70 of them come out this year and said the same thing that they said four years ago. But General Mattis, Colin Powell, George Will, Elliot Cohen, uh, John Kasich, on and on and on have come out and said he does not deserve to be president of the United States. And I can't answer your question about what will happen if uh, he is either elected. I think things could get very, very bad in this country. But if he loses the election and tries to stay in office, I do, I have some confidence that people like Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham will step up to the plate. I don't have much respect for either of them or people like Ted Cruz, who Trump abused, of course, but, uh, supports Trump. But I would think that by then, if there was a clear electoral victory for Biden, I can't see Trump staying. I think Trump is desperate. I mean, the polls show that he's behind anywhere from three to five to 10 points. And that's why he's inflaming public opinion, trying to send stormtroopers into different cities like the Nazis did, uh, going to Kenosha himself. What good can he do other than to stir up trouble? But I think he's desperate. And frankly, Hal, I think he, he knows that if he's defeated, he, the attorney in New York State has got the goods on his uh, fraudulent activities, not only with Deutsche Bank, but other activities and that he may be destined for jail like and guess what i mean some of these republican and independent voters who like trump look at trump's closest supporters where are they paul manafort's in jail roger stone convicted seven uh, and then pardoned by trump steve bannon one of his closest supporters chief strategist he's just been arrested for phlegm flamming and abusing a uh, nonprofit that supposedly was going to build the wall, turned out used money for himself. Michael Cohen, uh, on and on and on. He has trampled on the rule of law, in addition to our Constitution, so many times, uh, and I just think he'll continue to do it, from insulting judges to firing inspector generals, which I guess he can have a right to do, but once they criticize him, he fired the U.S. attorney in New York because he was on his trail, uh, although the new one is probably there too. He violated election laws. He paid, uh, ordered paid Stormy Daniels, the uh, porn star, $130,000 to keep her silent. That's a violation of election law. Another violation of law that he's, or he's trampled on our rule of law is by inviting uh, Russians to interfere or encouraging the interfere at least and uh, he's uh, accepted foreign influence in our elections president. thank you very much fred i appreciate very much the time you took to uh, be with us uh we'll be back again next month
with another episode of uh, Patients on the News. Uh, and Fred, you're welcome to come back at another time. And thanks again. Well, after the election. Okay, thanks, Hal. Okay.